the rabbi see. And the rabbi see. Everybody will be singing. Everybody will be singing. La 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 la. La 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 la. Everybody will be singing. La 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 la. La 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 la. Everybody will be singing. When the rabbi stops. When the rabbi I'm Phil Goebel. I'm preparing right now to go downstairs into a theater and portray a rabbi named Shaul or Saul. He is the most widely read rabbi in the world because his other name is Paulos or Paul the Apostle. And he is a major author of the Jewish document dramatized in the play that we are about to present. The last words Paul the Apostle ever wrote are these. Greetings to you from Eubulus and Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. In a moment, we're going to go back in time over 1,900 years. We're going to join Eubulus and Pudens and Linus and Claudia and that audience of Jewish and other believers with Paul in Rome. We're going to use a contemporary audience to play their parts and to take their seats. We're going to use our imaginations and descend the slimy, foul-smelling steps of a dungeon deep in the bowels of the earth under Nero's city, the city of Rome. We're going to pretend that we, the audience, have been lowered with Paul down into his cell. And Dr. Luke, his assistant, is peering down on us from the ceiling hole in the dungeon cell. The time is around 65 to 68 of our common era, when the only legal religions in Rome were the worship of Caesar Nero and the Jewish religion. Paul's enemies are telling Nero that Paul's Messiah has made Paul no longer Jewish. This is a dangerous accusation. The Apostle Peter has already probably been martyred just as 30 years before in Jerusalem. Stephen had also given his life. As our story begins, Paul is trying to finish a letter to his young associate Timothy, whose life may also soon be in danger in Ephesus in what is today modern Turkey. Paul is running out of time. The good news, according to Luke, has not yet been written. Neither has the book of Acts. Paul is getting ready to go before Nero for his final hearing. Join us now for the rabbi from Tarsus. When the rabbi stops, when the rabbi stops, everybody will be crying. off to look. Doctors shouldn't fall asleep on their patients. But it's morning anyway, isn't it? Can't even hear the Roman roosters down here in this solitary confinement cell. Luke, am I getting hard of hearing? Will you speak up? I said it is morning, isn't it? Did Demas bring word on Nero yet? Yes, this morning. Wake up, Luke. My final hearing is at dawn. I specifically instructed Demas to bring us word on Nero 
before the guards come for me. Tudor, he told you about Tudor's and Claudia, didn't he? Their informants are going to try to find out Nero's private reaction to my first defense speech. Demas hasn't even been here since yesterday. Lucas. Lucas, 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 Lucas. You are a friend who sticks closer than a brother. What fools for God we doctors are. Me, a Jewish doctor of the law of Moses. You, a Gentile doctor of the body. <laughs> I can just see you now with your most unwomanly white beard and this pregnant bulge under your cloak. It's a miracle you were able to slip this past the gate. Did you know this is genuine Algam Wood? Algam Wood! Yes. Like King David's harps in the temple. Oh, I had a dream last night, Luke, about the song. I taught Silas at Philippi 15 years ago, and about the earthquake when God rescued us from prison. Then I woke up in prison again. There's nothing like music to lift your spirits, Luke. But I don't play just an old Saul like King David did to my ancestor Saul. I make melodies in my heart to the Lord. When I was first shown my sumptuous quarters, the pungent smell made me think some Roman latrine drained down here. Then slowly I began to get the picture. This is a Roman latrine. <laughs> Nero, Nero, you subtle poet, you. You're trying to tell me something. Uh, here's a line for you. Oh, to awaken the morn to the smell of human waste and the pitter-patter sound of soft little feet, little rat's feet. And this bread they gave me already has a generous supply of green mold on it, which appears to be alive. The baker obviously doesn't know whom he's feeding down here, Luke. Or maybe he does. I think I'll call this place Hamalon Haklumnikim. What? That's Hebrew, doctor, for the hotel good for nothing. <laughs> the chef should be informed that I am a dignitary who has dined in the filthiest dungeons in the Roman Empire. I am used to the vilest trafe under heaven, and I demand to know if this is the worst he can do. <laughs> Yet somehow, Lord, when I think about you, this dungeon makes a fitting apostle scriptorium. We are the scum of the earth. Doctor, what do you think of my first trial? My first trial. You were awake, weren't you? Oi. I asked for a lawyer and you give me a doctor. Did you notice the puzzled look on Nero's face? For a 28-year-old god, he certainly doesn't know much about Judaism. How do you explain Judaism to a demon-possessed madman, Luke? By letter. <laughs> yes, I wish I could. What do you suppose Nero's thinking? I don't think he does either. Why has God made Nero, of all people, the world's final authority on what is and is not the true Jewish faith? I'm not saying that. Luke, granted Judaism is a legally protected religion, and Caesar is the final judge of the Roman Supreme Court. But Nero, you wouldn't know a good moil from a bad boil. I must have made some impression on him, though. Otherwise, why did he send me back into custody? Or even give me another hearing this morning? 
A mere routine procedure, you think? I know. But, so, very shortly, I shall either be declared guilty and be beheaded, or the death sentence will be commuted and my life will be spared. But what have I done? The charges are utterly ridiculous. What crime have I committed against the Roman government or the Jewish temple? my own Jewish people. I put it to my fellow prison rats. Stop trying to sneak a bite of my last piece of bread and answer this question. How about it, cellmates? Is the Jewish high priest right? Do I look like a treasonable, heretical rabble-rouser? Me, the Apostle Paul. What's the verdict, my red-eyed jury? Even these rats know I'm in for more time than they are. It's hard to believe, Luke. For the last eight years, most of the time, I've been living in prison. And time is running short. We've got to finish this letter to Timothy. Is your stylus sharpened, Luke? And please, doctor, write legibly. Oi. I asked for a scribe, and you give me a doctor. Oh, Timothy, my son. My son, Timothy. Oh, I wish you were here. You have been like a son to me in all my trials. How little time there is. So much to write you. I miss you so much, Timothy. The sad longing, with a sad, sad longing like God has for his son Israel. Will I never see you again in Ephesus, my son, or here? Lift the sorrow from me, Lord. I've lost too much. I've come too far. Don't let me fall into bitterness now. Where is God, my maker? who gives songs of deliverance in the night. <clears throat> Luke, I have no one like Timothy. Selfless, full of concern and loyalty. But he's so young and timid. The false teachers and the troublemakers in Ephesus are violent men. Alexander the coppersmith will make a stew pot out of them. Hashem Rabono Shalom. If I die this morning, is this how I must leave all the congregations you gave me during my ministry as an apostle in Ephesus to a soft-spoken young Jewish man, not even 35 years old? Timothy, my successor. Who's that coming down the stairs, Luke? Demas! You made it, Baruch Hashem! Did you get to speak to the brothers in Caesar's household? Yes, Linus too, wonderful. What impudence of Claudia you say? What? Nero is toying with what? Executing me on the grounds that I'm not a Jew. The house of all has seen them, I'm not a Jew. <laughs> Rats. Rats! So that's what the God of this evil world is sharpening his teeth on. Charging me with the crime of inventing an illegal religion. How charming. A foreign superstition distinct from Judaism without Judaism's legal protection by the Roman law. So that's what Nero is toying with. He knows I can't be made a scapegoat like Simon Peter. I proved I was not in Rome last summer at the time of his little fire. <laughs> Wouldn't he love to crucify me upside down? But I saw have a Roman named Paulus Paul, and Kivus Romanus Sum, I am a Roman citizen, an old Kivus. Simon Peter of Arjona was just an old fisher Jew from Galilee. And many of the other believers Nero crucified 
burned alive, through to the wild dogs in the arena, while he acted like some great blind Homer, reciting his poems to the tune of his lyre, declaring his poetry would live forever. I doubt if it will live till Passover. But Caesar is the lord of his own life, and Caesar is the lord of this evil world. He's had his belly full of me. Who do I think I am? Single little rabbi running all over his Roman Empire, proclaiming that someone greater than Nero is the lord of the world, the Jewish Messiah? I'll bet he breaks a liar string every time he thinks about me, Luke. He granted me clemency during my first trial. That was two years ago when he said he had never heard of me. But I sense the demon in him knew me well. So, now the devil has put me in prison again to test me. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And we shall love him with all our being. Nero, tell us, are you the beast? The beast! The false messiah from hell who will kill millions of my Jewish people at the time of Jacob's trouble? Or are we Jews to expect another? What? Oh, that's right, Luke. Nero can't be the false messiah. The prophet Daniel did say that the false messiah would defile the temple in Jerusalem. And fat Nero is too lazy to make the trip. So Rabbi Nero thinks he has found an excuse to circumcise my head, mazel tov. I suppose he will put it on a platter with that other non-Jew, Yohanan Hamad Beel, John the Baptizer. When that proud liar Satan lies, he loves to lie big, and all the little Neros in this world believe him in their pride. Our blind hearts tell us we are gods, Luke. But our vowels speak more truthfully. We are fallen, evil-smelling clay. Nero, I have no weapon of this world to fight you. My only sword is the word of God. But he will conquer you, you grasshopper, and you will have the burial of a donkey. But how do I win this battle, Lord? I've got to decide. What do I do? Do I spend these last precious minutes thinking how to defend my own life at the trial before Nero this morning? Or thinking how to defend the believers who are and will be endangered by this beast? If Peter or James had not been martyred, how would they advise me now, Luke? Everyone's gone. Even my family. What would my mother say to me now? My Jewish mother? She would call me by my Jewish name, as she did when I was a boy, and she would say, What were you, Saul of Tarsus, Hebrew of all Hebrews, the Pharisee of all Pharisees, the Hasid of all Hasidim, the rabbi of all rabbis doing? Getting mixed up with a roly poly band of countryfied Galileans and worse yet, unkosher Gentiles. Oy vey. <laughs> My dear mother would have jumped out of her grave to think that such a thing could happen to a nice Jewish boy at the feet of Gamaliel. My father. My Jewish father paid the great rabbi Gamaliel, successor to the immortal Hillel, to make me a rabbi. My father would have demanded a refund. I can hear him now. Gamliel, Shamliel. I send him down a Jew. He sends me back a Goy. Such a bargain. <laughs> so now my only father is in heaven. My only counselor is his word and his spirit. Nearly all my disciples are deserting me. With death closing in on me, everyone fears for his own life. Now I am avoided by the very ones who used to admire me, those, those Hasidim, 
those, those Pharisees with the Kohen Agadol, the high priest, who has forced me to live apart as unclean of a Shumad, a traitor to my people, the supreme apostate, they say, of Judaism. So here I sit, like an owl among the ruins of a long, hard ministry. Demas? Luke? What do I do? Work on my defense speech. Try to win the praises of men. <laughs> Some praise. How shall I win the praises of men? From the world's point of view, I am a fool. I want you men to know I could have been a sought-after rabbi, a Talmud Chacham, happily married, the father of numerous doting children, the head of my rich father's tent-making firm in Tarsus, praised by everyone, as my enemies want so badly to be, and many so-called believers too. Instead, what kind of life have I known? Demas, I want you to listen to me now, because the Lord wants to use you and Luke. But you do not know my manner of life. I want you to go warn the congregation here in Rome, because they don't either. Some of them love the praises of men. And they're becoming arrogant, especially toward my Jewish people. They must be exhorted, Hayashua men, Hayahudim, He! Salvation is from the Jews! They must understand why have I suffered all my life for the sake of God's chosen? Some of these Roman congregants think they're so spiritually rich and superior. Oh. Most of them are poor and blind. They won't lift a finger to help my Jewish people! They have forgotten that the godly people must fight to serve the Lord and His people in an evil world. Demas, will you promise me you will go to the congregation here in Rome and exhort them to keep trying to speak to my Jewish people? You promise. All right. Now listen to me, Demas. Because you weren't with us. In all my 30 years of ministry, I have never tried to win the praises of men. I've been in prison many times. I've been flogged often and severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times my preaching in the synagogues cost me the 40 lashes minus one for my own people. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my own people, and danger in the city, danger in the country, danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled with my tent maker's needle, a weaver of tents, paying my own way, being a burden to no one, often going without sleep. I've known hunger, thirst. I've gone without food. Even now it's winter, I don't have a warm cloak. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure. Pressure of all the tsuras, of all the congregations I've helped establish throughout the world. And what has all this gotten me? The praises of men? <laughs> Some praise I get from many of the so-called believers sitting daintily now in the very congregations I risk my neck to establish? Why, they say I'm nothing but a weakling. 
an arrogant rider, but a yes man in person. They say I do suspicious things with my hands, like earn a living. They say I take no money because I'm not worth any. Oh, it's true. I'm a regular road bandit. I rob whole congregations with the privilege of paying me a salary. Forgive me. They say my preaching is useless. My message will get nowhere. I'm spiteful, money-hungry, carnal, masuga. I hate women, and I am crazy. Luke, other than that, they have the highest admiration for me. So what do I do? Yes, I knew you were going to say that. But what did the Lord say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his interests, not the interests of self. And what is the promise? We will be taken before kings and governors on account of God, but God will give us the words... God will give us the word. God is Kings and governors, but God will... I've got it! I've got it! I've got it! I've got it. I made a decision. The Lord is giving me a plan to protect the brothers. A narrative must be written. A history, my legal brief before Nero, must be transferred formed into a theological apologetic, a defense of the faith, to protect the Lord's people throughout the world until he comes. And in this regard, I want to share with both of you the Lord's world strategy, because you two will continue it for me if I am... You what? He slipped out. Demas left! When? Right after the third beating with rods. He left. When is he coming back? Nobody listens to us. Nobody cares if the world goes to hell. We're, we're losing our strategic thrust around the world. You men may have to take over my work, and he can't even... Luke, I wanted to hear about the Lord's work, but what the Lord has been showing me, how the people of God must be gathered all over the world and, if possible, protected against Nero and the false teachers and warned about the false Messiah who's coming. Look down here, Luke. I guess you'll have to write it. The life of the Messiah and the acts of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Let this be the world in bondage to deep darkness and evil. Here's Israel, where God will plant his people forever, and her Messiah, the light of the world. Here's where I spread the light, establishing congregations in Galatia, Macedonia, Greece, Asia Minor. Here's the light shining from Israel to Rome, but now the prince of darkness is coming, Luke, who hates the light. And the Jews, he will try to make it illegal for us Jews even to live, even to be called Jews. Look down here, Luke. There's a Talmudic saying, even if a Jew sins, he is still a Jew. So, explain how, both before and after I came to faith, I was still a Jew, taking increasingly dangerous trips to Jerusalem. To prove, even if the proof cost me my life, that I was still, in fact, a temple-attending, Israel-loyal, synagogue-preaching rabbi. Show the whoever I as a rabbi preached. The unbelievers turned from idolatry. And only the unbelievers caused trouble, like they did when they tried to kill me in Ephesus because of the Shema, saying, This uh, rabbi is bad for the idol-making business. <laughs> but you record the historical truth, Luke, that whenever I went before a sane Roman leader in government, whether it was Sergio Paulus in Cyprus, 
or the magistrates in Philippi, or Gallio in Corinth, or Governor Felix, or Festus in Caesarea, or even King Agrippa in Israel. Whenever I went before a Roman leader in government who was sane, I was regarded as a Jew and my religion as Jewish and legal. So if Nero is toying with the idea of killing me because I'm no longer Jewish, he is toying with a lie from hell. Who is a bigger liar than the man who says you cannot be Jewish if you believe in the Messiah? Does anyone honestly think that I don't know all the high priest's arguments, all the reasons he's giving Nero right now not to protect me because my religion isn't Jewish? Who do you suppose invented most of those reasons to prove that the followers of the Nazarene weren't really Jewish, Luke? Who do you suppose was the high priest, chief prosecutor of these Messianic Jews, Luke? You're looking at him. Are you taking notes, Luke? Now, Stephen. Stephen. Stephen, as you know, was a rabbi. He had a following. He was a, an apostle. He saw the Lord. He was a wonder worker of the sect. I thought it was a heretical cult, even though there were no Jews. And uh, even though that, well, there were no Gentiles. I was, I was trying to make a name for myself at the synagogue, the synagogue of the freedmen in Jerusalem. Now, I preached about the Messiah, that he would be the Holy One, that he would bring peace to Israel and the nations. But not like the followers of the Nazarene, Luke. They were proclaiming a crucified dead man to be the Messiah. He tried to prove that he was alive at the right hand of God by the eyewitness testimony of 500 of his former followers who claimed to have seen him alive from the dead, but most of these so-called eyewitnesses I saw as country yokels. School ignoramuses. Ignoramus I? Ignoramus I? What's the Latin plural of ignoramus, Luke? What do you mean, how should you know? This is Rome. What is a doctor without Latin? <laughs> anyway, the Torah says, the Torah says that if any Jew is hanged on a tree. He is accursed by God. He's damned by God. Cut off from God. But the Mashiach, blessed be he, the Messiah, was to be the Holy One of Israel. And how could the Holy One of Israel be the accursed one of Golgotha? It was foolishness to me. It was a contradiction in terms. As a Hasid, a, a, a Pharisee, I perceived this movement as a dangerously growing cult enticing ignorant Jews away from Judaism. So one day I confronted this Stephen in front of the synagogue of the freedmen in Jerusalem. I said, Stephen, you're no longer a Jew. You're destroying many of our people, leading them to believe in a false god, an idol that you have shaped in the form of a man. He called me by my Hebrew name, he said. So God has already proven that the Messiah is the divine word that he sent. How? By resurrecting him from the dead. Stephen, I'm a Jew. I believe in only one God. The Father and his divine word are one. Saul so Ehud. There is but one God who has but one word who became the Messiah. Be reasonable, Stephen. Can anything good come out of Galilee? Who was this nobody from Nazareth? He was a know-nothing, a lawbreaker. He broke the Torah by driving demons into innocent pigs. Saul, have you ever met an innocent pig? <laughs> Stephen, have you no compassion for animals? I have more compassion for a crucified Messiah who loved me. He was a momzer who worked his magic by occult powers. 
That's all he said. He did only what he saw his father doing, and only in the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. He was a Samaritan with a deviant Judaism that is no Judaism at all. Saul, he came to bring what Judaism promised, the bodily resurrection of the dead. Then why isn't everyone raised bodily from the dead? Because those who hear and believe must first be raised spiritually from death to life. Look, I was totally blind to what he was talking about. I was speaking only about external religion. I have a question for you, Stephen. If this Nazarene is the Prince of Peace, then where is the Yamim Shal Mashiach, the age of the Messiah, with all the world peace that the Prophet said the Messiah would bring? He did not promise peace to a world who rejects him, Saul. Just where is he anyway? The Prophet said he's supposed to be sitting on David's throne. I don't see him. That's because you're blind to the kingdom of God and to the word of God who is king and will one day be your judge. Where's your faith, Rabbi? My faith is in the law of Moses. Torah, Moshe, Torah, Amin, Hashemayim, the law of Moses is the Torah from heaven. Yes, Saul, but in the law of Moses, what does the word of God require? What is the legal penalty of justice so that no evil goes unpunished? Death, of course, you know that, Stephen. It is the curse of transgressing the law. Correct, Saul. And when the word of God, who came in the law of Moses, finally came in the Messiah, what did he offer as justice and mercy for all transgressions? His death, Saul. Of course, he turned aside his father's holy fury against all our ungodliness. He took the penalty of death for us when he said, My God, why hast thou abandoned me? He was God's righteous word taking our curse, the curse of abandonment from God, the curse of hell upon himself. He did this so all who hear and believe can be raised to a new spiritual existence with him. Stephen, you're talking like a Greek philosopher. I am talking like Moses, King David, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, who all said the same thing. We must be cut free and raised up from the downward pull of evil by an inward circumcision of the Holy Spirit. Your Messiah is a haven! You've taken a man, you've turned him into an accursed human idol. I have a question for you, Stephen. Did the prophet Yoel say, whoever calls on the name of an accursed human idol will be saved from God's judgment? No. We Jews do not worship men. You, Stephen, are no longer a do. We Jews worship God through his word. Saul, which is the only way to God, and his word became the Messiah, who is the only way to God. He was the devil, Stephen! In the pride of his heart, this devil has said, I am a god, and I will sit on the throne of a god. He was a blaspheming man, and not a god. And if I had it in my power, I myself would have driven my tit needles into his hands and feet. He was wounded for our transgressions. So that prophecy is talking about Israel. Can Israel die for Israel? So every man must die for his own sins. That's right. I must die for me, not some mediator. No mere man can die for another man. But he was no mere man. Saul, the prophet said, Unto us a son is born. His name shall be called El Gibor in Hebrew, mighty God. You are interpreting Isaiah literally. Because the Messiah was literally seen alive from the dead. His disciples stole the body. foretold about him in the law and the prophets. He was born in Bethlehem, as was predicted. Of the house of Judah, the tribe of David, as was predicted. He healed the sick, he cleansed the lepers, he gave sight to the blind, as was predicted. He was betrayed by a friend, he was sold for 30 pieces of silver. He was pierced in his hands and his feet, but his body did not see decay, as was predicted. Prophecy after prophecy he fulfilled, so he got lucky. Now shut up, Stephen Sheckett. No 
only a man could ever change me, Luke. My rabbi, Rabbi Gamaliel, tried to reason with me. Saul, leave these Jewish men alone. If their activity is of human origin, it will utterly fail, like the followings of so many false messiahs. But if it is from God, Saul, you will not be able to stop these Jewish men. You will only find yourself fighting against God. Well, I disagreed with my rabbi, and I was ready for a fight. For one thing, they were gaining an enormous number of adherents. In fact, there were more of them than us. There were only 6,000 Pharisees. We were the Jews of the strictly orthodox persuasion. I knew that we were right and they were wrong. These Messianic Jews, these Jews that proclaim the Messiah. Now, this was no small matter, Luke, because the Torah says that if any Jew tries to entice another Jew to believe in another God other than the God of Israel, that person must be stoned. He must be put to death. Because he is worse than one who destroys Jewish bodies. He destroys Jewish souls by leading them away from the true God and into hell. All this happened shortly before Stephen was arrested and put on trial for heresy. Before the Supreme Court in Israel. And I can still see, I can still see that young rabbi with what appeared to me at the time to be the most brazen defiance and disrespect I'd ever seen. Immediately, Stephen stood up before the Sanhedrin. And he said, in Jerusalem. You, who say that I, Stephen, am no longer a Jew, you are no more Jews than Herod! Herod has turned the Jewish temple into a golden calf for you. But the Messiah is breaking camp to lead the true Jews out to the world build a house of prayer for all peoples. The God of Israel is on the move. But you're fighting God, like our fathers fought Joseph, even though God wanted to use Joseph. God wanted to test Joseph in prison so that Joseph could be a worthy vessel to feed bread to the whole world. But our fathers tried to kill him like they almost stoned Moses. Do you think God wants to languish here with you and your religious pageantry? Do you think Israel is the only nation God loves? It's time to disciple the Gentiles! But all you know is religion. You know nothing about God's suffering love for the whole world. 600 years ago, Jeremiah stood where I'm standing. He prophesied against our fathers in their temple. They tried to kill him as you're trying to kill me, but God fulfilled his word and that temple was destroyed, you blind guides. Immigrants! You're trying to ignore the Messiah's sacrifice and go on with the business of religion as usual. I have a word from the Lord for you. Your temple, your sacrifice, your high priest is on the way out. But the body of God's sacrifice, His temple, although it has been torn down by men, has already been raised up forever by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now the islands are waiting. They're waiting for His Torah, His teaching. But we Jews have been given a new commission. And it's later than we think. The new Adam of the new humanity of the new age is already bodily alive. The new wine of the Holy Spirit is already being poured out on the whole world. But you, you're totally blind 
mere religious functionaries devoid of the spirit. You Sadducees, you love to call King David and Daniel liars by denying the resurrection. You love to say, when you did, you did. You Sadducees should know you've already been dead for generations. Oh, and you Pharisees, you love to nullify the Word of God with your oral traditions. You think even God doesn't know as much about religion as you do. You are leading our people to destruction. If you defy these words, which are not mine but God's, given long ago by His holy prophets, and today by His holy apostles, then you are unregenerate goyim! You are heathen at heart! Pagan hypocrites masquerading as Jews! And you will be cast headlong into the lake of everlasting hell fire! Because you always resist God's word and you kill his holy messengers. Look, we wanted to kill him. We wanted to beat Stephen's brains out. As one man, we leaped from our seats. We dragged him down through the corridors of the Sanhedrin, out into the streets of Jerusalem. And we tossed him as a blood splattered mass of wounds into a stone pit. And don't say that I experienced a pang of guilt as he bowed his head to pray and said, Look, I can see the Son of Man. Standing at the right hand of God. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. At that moment, I felt no compassion, Luke. I wouldn't have cared if he had sprouted of angel wings and started to fly. I wanted him dead. Why? How can you say why, Luke? Because one of us was dead wrong and I was sure it wasn't going to be me. But be informed about this. I have never been ridden with guilt. All my life I have served my God with a clear conscience and a sincere heart as my ancestors did who were rabbis before me. Recently it is true that uh, an accusing thought has come to me along with a thorn in the flesh as a messenger of Satan, say, Aha! Aha! What you did to Stephen is now being done to you! The persecutor is now the persecuted! The executioner is now the victim. As it is written, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. And there is no favoritism, not for Moses, not for King David, not for Saul. But Luke, I walk by faith, not by appearances. By faith, I've been taken out of God's condemnation. God is for me. Nothing can separate me from his love. Be clear about that. Don't you see, at the time, not feeling guilty at all, I saw it as my solemn Jewish duty to go to Caiaphas, the Kohen Agadol, the high priest, to uh, receive permission to organize a corps of uh, rabbis to go with me to disrupt their messianic synagogue services and their secret house meetings to teach them a lesson against heresy they wouldn't forget. There were too many of them to stone them all, but I was sure we could at least frighten them into their senses. For this purpose, I procured a long, ugly whip that could cut through human flesh like a knife through certain infiltrating spies and informants I was alerted every week of their secret meeting places so that I could burst
Christ in a box by Christ, smash up their furniture, lies at their screaming women and children, beat their men half to death, knocking out teeth, ripping off clothes, kicking in their faces till the blood poured. Throwing them into the temple prison until they decided whether they wanted to recant their blasphemous heresy or join Stephen at the stoning pit. That's how it came about, Luke. That I, Saul Tarsus, the Pharisee, the Hasid, the rabbi, became known to these messianic Jews as the angel of death. I'll never forget this one beautiful Messianic Jewish girl we arrested, Luke. This is not for the record. She had long, lovely black hair and the softest eyes. But what infuriated me was when she saw us coming into her house and tearing up the furniture, instead of screaming like the other Messianic Jewish women, she was standing in the back moving her lips, speaking calmly to someone, but staring at me. There was too much noise in the room to hear what she was saying. I had to press close to her face. To hear, you understand. Oh, she was praying for my soul in the name of this dead Nazarene. I shook her. I tried to make her blaspheme his name. I said, you sure hate him like that? Jesus, a curse on you. Say it! She began to pray louder, defying me. Suddenly the room became deathly still while everyone paused from tearing up the furniture to listen to this beautiful Messianic Jewish girl praying at the top of her lungs for the Nazarene to save my soul. I was embarrassed beyond words. I shook her. Someone dragged her off to be locked up with the others. And Luke, if I had taken time to take a wife, as my rich father was insisting, since I was an ordained rabbi, I possibly headed for membership in the Sanhedrin. And uh, Luke, if she and I had met under, how shall you say it, different circumstances, uh, I might have allowed myself to feel uh, an attraction. Never become a religious fanatic, Luke. <laughs> Doctors are hard enough to deal with as it is. Who are you talking to just now? Well, what did the guard want? I'm terribly sorry I'm making too much noise. Tell him to go sharpen his sword. There's nothing worse than being hit on the neck with a dull sword. They won't even let me have a knife down here to cut my hair. I look like Samson without the muscles. Oh, I'd give anything for one warm bath, Luke. I'm reminded of that couple we spoke to in Philippi, Luke. Do you remember? They both had leprosy and she was blind. They were beggars sitting on a dunghill by the city gate. Do you remember? They seemed anxious to meet us until they found out we had no money. Then the man became preoccupied with himself. He was pulling off these horrible pieces of skin from under his leprous rags, rolling them up into needle balls, examining them with great decisions, and then throwing them carelessly over his shoulders. Do you remember that, Luke? Finally, you said, excuse me, I'm Dr. Luke. I'd like you to meet the Apostle Paul. That's how you said it, Luke. The Apostle Paul. <laughs> He said, leave me alone, I'm busy, I'm working on something. We see that, yes. We were watching with fascination the arc of each piece of, uh, what shall you call it, debris as it sails through the air. Finally you said, but sir, are you really that busy? You're all here all day as a beggar and a leper. Now mind you, we're all beggars, we're all lepers in the sight of God, since everything, even life, is a gift and we all need to be cleansed from evil. But why sit around here picking at yourself all the time? Won't you let us help you? I don't need religion. At that point, you became exasperated, if you'll recall, Luke. You said, I'm not talking about mere religion. I'm talking about righteousness. It's a gift. You're a beggar. Take it. <laughs> You're a leper. Don't you want to be cleansed? Why, I'm a good person. I never hurt anyone in my life. Who did I ever hurt? And with that, he threw a ball of himself over his shoulder, and it landed on top of his poor blind wife's head. 
Finally, our hearts went out to this poor blind lady with the pile of her husband's debris on the top of her head. You went to her, Luke, and you said, we recognize that you're a blind man, but if you'll let us lead you, we'll take you to where the Apostle Paul teaches here at Lydia's house in Philippi. You're such a sweet little lady. We know you'll enjoy it. Now, how about it? I'm Dr. Luke. This is the Apostle Paul. How would you enjoy a gathering for the study of the Torah? How would you enjoy me spitting in your eye, creepo? <laughs> I've never seen you at such a loss for words, Luke. Whenever I get sad, I think about the expression on your face. And I get happy all over again. You might have, you might have said what our prophets have declared, Luke. All our own tzedakah, righteousness, is like leprosy rags. Ah, oh, but God's people will be credited with God's righteousness because they live by faith, by loving, loyal, sacrificial, holy trust in God. That was 15 years ago, Luke. I pray that that couple woke up. That was my problem, Luke. I needed to wake up. I didn't know what time it was. And it was later than I thought. Now, some of this you know, some you don't know. But I want you to make one thing clear in your apologetic. Whether Nero or any of my other critics understands it or not, I did not change my religion. I changed my time reference. And God changed my heart. But wait, my critics say, who cares about your heart, Paul, or your life? Other rabbis have been defrocked. Other Jews have been excommunicated. Of what great moment, Paul, is your incessant teaching, your endless sermons? What great battle rages in the trial of my life? What is at stake here, Luke? What am I fighting for? Only the salvation of Israel and the world, nothing more. And if the issue of this conflict is of no import, where is there any weighty drama? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And if what I attest about the Nazarene is not the truth, then we, his suffering servants, are of all men most pitifully, tragically naive, and the hope of Israel is dead. But here is what happened. I have received reliable information that there was a stubborn nest of these heretics in the Damascus synagogue. The other rabbis in the temple guards and I had just crossed the desert from Galilee. It was about noon. The sun was high in a clear blue sky, as clear as heaven. And then the second sun blasted down on us from nowhere, lighting up everything like a consuming fire. At first I couldn't fathom what my eyes were showing me. I was seeing what Mary Magdalene and Peter and 500 others had seen nearly three years before. Young as I was, the divine out of noise the word of the Lord that came to Moses in the burning bush was coming toward me, Luke, revealing himself to me in the east as in the dawn of time, figure like a man, fire all around him, his eyes very sorrowful, his face very sad. He spoke to me in the language of the Hebrews. Shaul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The glory in his face was brighter than the sun. Like the glory of God. I fall off my horse. I was too frightened to move. I said, who are you, Lord? Very clearly, 
The voice came from out of the fire. I am Yehoshua, Yeshua of Nazareth, Jesus. I am sending you as a light, my light to the Gentiles. The Lord made his face shine upon me. It was gracious unto me. But all the earth be silent before him. I sat overwhelmed. My eyes in total glare from the excessive light. I found out later that the other rabbis in the temple guards did hear and see something. They weren't clear on what it was. I was led blind into the house of Judas. Judas! On the street called Straight, where arrangements had already been made for me to lodge the night. Had it literally dawned on me that I was blind to the will of God? Or had I hallucinated? I prayed and I fasted for three days. Asking God to give me spiritual and physical sight. I remember how I prayed. God of Israel, have I been missing the true way of Judaism? Have I been leaning on my own understanding rather than acknowledging your will? Have I been leaning on my own righteousness? rather than your righteous word, the Messiah. This Nazarene, I had heard of him, Lord. But now my eyes have seen him. Therefore, I abhor what I have done. And with deep conviction to Shiva, I turn to you for forgiveness of sin. Not only in what I have done, but what, in what I am even in my religiosity. Now, I'm a Jew, Lord. I'm going to die. I want to die fully a Jew. But if you'll show me the truth, uh, I'll do it. And at that exact moment, Lord, oh, at that exact moment, the Lord answered my prayer because there was another man in Damascus, probably the only man I would have listened to because he was a deeply religious Jew. He believed in this Messiah, though his name was Ananias. And on the third day, the Lord appeared to Ananias, and he also became an apostle. When the Lord said to him, Ananias, yes, Lord, I have something I want you to do. Oh, yes, Lord, I'm your servant. I'll do anything. What is it that you require? I have someone I want you to go minister to and pray with. Gladly, Lord, I'll pray with anyone in Damascus. Who is he? The man named Saul, who's come down here to arrest you and kill you. <laughs> well, I'm awfully busy today, Lord. Does that have to be done today? Today. But, Lord, you know why he's come down here to Damascus to arrest the whole lot of us Messianic Jews and put us in prison in Jerusalem. He's one of the Hasidim, Lord. He's one of the Hasidim. What can I possibly tell him? Ananias. Yes, Lord. Just tell him I said to evangelize the whole world. I beg your pardon today. Tell one of the Hasidim to go to the Goyim today. 
<laughs> and as soon as Ananias placed his hands on me and prayed for my sight, something like scales, little cataract-like tissues fell from my eyes into my fingers. And I could see... And as soon as I saw those two little tissues, I knew that the Yomot HaMashiach had begun. The, the age of the Messiah was already dawning, and I had received the same spirit that Joshua, Caleb, and Elijah, and all the others had received. I had been born into a new spiritual existence, Luke. I had been born from above. I had been born again. I was a new creation. Now, I must pause here for the benefit of the scoffers that you will have to refute, Luke. The unbelievers who will say, well, what was the problem, doctor? What exactly made Paul switch? Or oh, not religions, but vocations from that of persecutor to that of advocate and apostle. What was the problem? These unbelievers will say, wasn't it just a mere case of sunstroke, hallucination? Guilt catharsis, nervous collapse, honest mistake. <laughs> what is truth for you, Saul, is not truth for me, these unbelievers will say. There are natural explanations for everything. Yes, yes, doctor. Here is the natural explanation. Yes. Oh, yes. One day, as I piously endeavored to enforce the law of Moses to the best of my ability as a rabbi, I, the arrester, was arrested by a naive superstition. A meteor just happened to blaze across the sky, yes. And at the very same time, it just happened to thunder so that the other rabbis in the temple guards did hear something. And at the very same time, clumsy schlemiel that I am, I just happened to fall off my horse. And at the very same time, just happened to hallucinate with a nightmare vision complete with face, fire, and voice. That just happened to be my enemy who just happened to want me to go to work for him among the very people who just happened to be my enemies, the Goyim, the heathen, the pagans, the Gentiles. And at the very same time, tissues just happened to form over both my eyes with a purely accidental case of coincidental cataracts. <laughs> yes, doctor, there are natural explanations for everything. If one happens to have enough bad, blind faith to go his own way, and many like Nero are lords of their own life, who want to go their own way, even if it leads to hell. But I had to trust God, like any other disciple. I had to take a step of faith into the mikvah waters of repentance baptism, into the Damascus synagogue, there with the other believers, nowhere in sight. And the rabbis standing by from Jerusalem with their mouths wide open. I stood up at the bima, and I preached a new rabbi sermon. One that I would preach in synagogues all over the world for the next 30 years. My Jewish brothers, and you Gentile God-fearers there in the back of the shul, listen to me. I have good news. God can make Jews out of anybody, even an old Gentile like Ruth, if we have her faith. Now, I tried to curse these Messianic Jews, but God has brought me to the point where I can do nothing but bless them, my brothers. I, I have good news. The word that promised life through Moses and the prophets has now destroyed death and has brought immortality to light through the Messiah. I know! I personally saw him alive from the dead. The same word is coming again at the end of this wicked age to judge everyone. Therefore, turn from this dying, wicked world. Come eternally alive to the new holy age that's already dawning. Joined by Jewish people who by faith looked for him before he came. Join them by living for him now that he is here. 
believe the good news? Well, look, some of them believed, but many didn't. Some of the Jewish people believed, but not very many did. Nor did very many Gentiles. Some of the rabbis tried to kill me. I couldn't blame them. I would have done the same thing. I, I know the truth of the saying. He who has been forgiven of much, forgives much. We've got to watch and pray, Luke. The evil one is coming. The evil one is coming. We've got to be ready to stand against him. I just remember I didn't, I haven't finished that letter to Timothy. If God will give me the strength to Timothy, my only son in the faith, and to Israel, God's blind, unfaithful wife. Spiritually still sound asleep. Why didn't you tell me the demons came back? Did he bring any news? What was it? He feels called to Thessalonica. He feels called to Thessalonica. I sent him to the congregation here in Rome. Is he going to keep trying to speak to my Jewish people? Why not? Why is he running? For his life. But he told him what? There's no chance. There's no chance for me. What about my second trial this morning, Luke? A mock trial? Well, did Demas hear what charge convicts me? The charge, Luke, are you falling asleep? Look at me! Treason against Nero, turning his little world upside down. Well, at least I'm still Jewish. Who will go, Luke? Who will go? Go to my Jewish people. The harvest has passed. Summer has ended. My Jewish people are not saved, Lord. Has it all been for nothing? All my sacrifices. Is there no healing balm in Gilead for Israel, Lord? <laughs> Save your people who follow so long. I could wish I were in hell if that would save them. I spent my life strength for nothing. A miserable failure. Luke, are you awake? Asleep. Hello.
phone, Luke. The whole world is asleep. Wake it up, Lord. One disciple betrays me, deserts me. One falls asleep on me. My enemies say, where is your God now, Paul? Thank you, Savior. My last piece of bread, Lord. It's one thing I do whenever I feel sad. It's one thing I do when I'm depressed. I forget about the past and all its evil dogs. And I press on. I press on with my Messiah, and suddenly, happily, I receive from him his love, his joy, and his peace, his gentleness, faithfulness, self, self-control. How can you be so weak, my son? Demas? Running back to a world that's dying to try to save your life. Let you know you can't take anything with you out of this dying world except the living word, the Messiah. Oh, Demas, Demas. I pray you'd come to see the man I came to know. The one who blinded me so long ago. The scales fell off my eyes, and I was healed of doubt. A dead man came alive. And I could shout I saw his face Blazing brighter than the sun The Son of God I disgraced My time had come, had come My time had come I'd been his enemy, he could have killed me then. Instead, he mercifully forgave my sin. I pray you'd come to see the man I came. such a liar. God is not executing me for killing Stephen. God used my sufferings for good to finish Stephen's work that I might have Stephen's honorable departure. And more than that, in suffering, I've known something of the suffering of this God of ours, the God of Israel, for his lost world. And it was to the world that I passed on the tradition from the Lord himself that on the night of his arrest and his betrayal and his imprisonment, he took bread, and after breaking it, he said, Baruch This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup after supper and he said, This is the Havrit HaChadashah, the new covenant seal in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Nero, you have everything going your way right now. My God can destroy your whole kingdom with five smooth stones. 
My last request is this, Lord. Give me one of those fire smooth stones. Give me one shot, Lord, one little, one parting shot. At the God of this evil world. I just remembered I haven't finished that letter to Timothy. If God will give me the strength. To Timothy. My only son of the faith. And to Israel. God's blind, unfaithful wife. Spiritually still sound asleep. Nero, you have me like a hummingbird in the hands of a crazed baboon. And I'm so weak, but when I am, then my God is most strong. I feel the Spirit of God coming on me. Luke, wake up! Write this down fast. Timothy, my son, I give you this solemn charge. In the presence of God and His Messiah, the Lord, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, proclaim the word, be ready in season, out of season, rebuke, encourage with all long suffering and patient teaching, because the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will accumulate for themselves a great number of teachers to soothe their own lust. Tell them what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn aside from listening to the truth. They'll turn to myths. But you, Timothy, always keep your head. Endure hardship. Continue to establish new congregations worldwide because I'm already on the point of being poured out as a drink offering to the Lord. And the time for my departure has arrived, but I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the race. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, Timothy, but to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come quickly, because Demas, in love with this passing world, has deserted me, and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark when you come, because he is profitable to the ministry. I left Tychicus in Ephesus. Bring the scrolls I left with Carpus at Troas, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for his evil deeds. You too should be on your guard against Alexander and Timothy because he strongly opposed our message. Stop the dictation, Luke. Seal up the message that Alexander the coppersmith opposed. The wages that sin pays is death. But... The free gift that God gives is eternal life. And this gift has been given even to me. Though I'm the least of the apostles, I'm not even worthy. I murdered. Sure. It's, nevertheless, it's not by good deeds that we're saved from God's judgment. It's by faith. This is, this is not from ourselves. It's a gift from God so that no one can boast. If we will confess Him unashamedly, before men, as Messiah and Lord, and receive him to have first place in our hearts, then he will confess us unashamedly before his Father. Continue the tick tick dictation, Luke. At my first trial, No man stood by me. All men forsook me. I pray 
God will not be held against them. Nevertheless, the Lord stood by at my side, and he gave me strength, so that through me all the Gentiles might hear, and I was del delivered out of the roaring lion Satan's mouth. And my God shall deliver me from every evil attack. Lo, hakavod lo You must learn Hebrew, Luke. To him be glory forever and ever, Romain. Greet Priscilla and Aquila in the house of Onesiphorus. Euvulus sends you greetings. So do Pudus and Linus and all the brothers here in Rome. Who are you talking to, Luke? It's all right, Luke. You can call them what they are. So, my executioners are here. Save my letters, Luke. Save my letters, Luke. Save my letters, Luke. Tell Timothy, I said, Grace be with you, my son. And Luke, Grace be with you, my friend, my friend Luke. And grace be with you.